My name's Scott Flanders. I'm an artist and game developer. <laughs> I'm literally bringing this in. <laughs> I'm here at Proco Studios. We're recording the last installment in our Halloween demo series. Today, we're gonna be creating an oil painting of Swamp Thing. We want a nice, smooth, clean surface. We don't want that stitching texture that you get in a canvas. We'll come over here to our palette. And this is gonna be a pretty simple paint mixture we're working with. It's basically tonal drawing in paint, very similar to the way you'd work with charcoal. So I'm gonna be using a mix of a burnt umber and a Prussian blue. What I want is to create a chromatic black, and I want to mix a warm color with a relatively cool color, so there'll be a little bit of neutralization. So the Prussian blue is a green blue or a cooler blue and my burnt umber is a warmer brown. Now the Prussian blue is a pretty strong pigment. It'll overpower other colors. So initially, when we're mixing this up, we wanna go heavier on the brown and lighter on the Prussian. And we wanna we want mix up a generous mixture. We actually, we want quite a bit. Because this mode of painting, it's, you know, I mentioned charcoal. You know, it's often the case when you're charcoal drawing, you're gonna go back and smear out or remove passages of the charcoal dust that you're putting on the paper. You're gonna use your kneaded eraser or your rag to remove the charcoal. And this is gonna be a very similar process where we're gonna be laying paint down and then we're gonna be coming back and, and removing passages. Sort of a back and forth process where you're gonna be adding and subtracting pigment. Laying passages of paint down and then pulling it away. And you can see here the Prussian is pretty strong. It's overpowering, like I mentioned, because I basically did like a 50-50 mix. It's not bad, but it's more blue than I would like. You're gonna see, I'm gonna press down hard and wipe away pigment to get back to the white of this panel. You ran the risk of like denting your canvas if you were that like brutal with it. Or now we have these very thin masonite panels. You know, they're artificially created out of particle board with glue and basically sawdust. Or canvas, you couldn't, you couldn't really, you didn't have that luxury. This is exactly what I'm looking for. It's this really buttery, what I call a chromatic black. It's just a kind of like a, a neutral green black. Dark pigment for dark subject matter. Now I can test the color by smearing some of it until it becomes a little thinner, more transparent, and that's perfect. Now I'm gonna test a little bit of it on my surface before we get going here. Now I'm just testing my transparency. I like that, it's good. Every time I mix this, I, I usually actually go with something a little bit different. And now it's time we take a look at our tools. Gamsol, just a mineral spirit, a very thick stand oil, like pure maple syrup or something. Over here, a little tin cup that I'm gonna be using to create my own mixture. I'm gonna pour some in my little cup. The Gamsol is, is basically, it's a solvent or a thinner. This is equivalent to like buying linseed oil straight off the shelf at the art supply store. I'm gonna be using a palette knife. I've got two here. For the most part, only gonna be using these two brushes. I've got an eight, a flat eight, and then a filbert, a 10 filbert. This is my favorite tool. The secret weapon, the sock. I kid you not. I call it rag painting, but a sock has a thinner weave and a less texture. It has like a, a very smooth surface, but then it also has a rough surface when you turn it inside out, which can allow you to get some interesting uh, textures. And they're also very cheap. I don't even know why, like why I thought this would be a good idea, but I started doing it when I was in college and it worked like incredibly well. And because you can use it like a glove, so I can get my hand in here and I can get all the sort of dexterity of my fingers, um, but then using this rag to pull out and absorb pigment. So it's really important that we prime the canvas initially to just help uh, ensure that our paint is going on nice and smooth and that we're flowing across the surface. So I'm gonna take a little bit of this mix here that we had. I'm gonna put some on our sock and I'm just gonna kind of wipe the whole canvas down. And we don't really mind about this little pigment test I did down here. I actually want to start to introduce some tone. If you have any experience with charcoal drawing, you've probably sort of like primed your paper or laid down a, like a mid-tone on your paper. You take the charcoal dust or the side of your charcoal stick and start to lay in a middle tone. That's exactly what I'm gonna do here. So I've got a glaze going. I'm begin to lay in some initial strokes. You notice I do not have a pencil drawing. For me, part of the fun of this style of painting is uh, finding the image. 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't see this as a design process or a, like a process that's optimized for designing or solving problems. It's a very playful, exploratory process about making marks, mark making, finding forms. At the end of one of these paintings, there's usually some evidence of the process like on record or on display. It's really common to uh, need to remove a passage to wipe it out when I'm painting like this to, because there is no underdrawing. You know, part of the purpose of an underdrawing, have your picture designed out very clearly, is so, you know, you've got a very clear like plan of action. You know where everything's supposed to be. And that has a lot of utility when you're on the job, like for production. But I also think it runs the risk of generating stale imagery. Not always, but I've mentioned in some of the earlier videos that, you know, as a creative person or an artist, my interest is primarily in, in mark making for some reason. And that's 100% what this style of painting is about. You know, I'm using one pigment, like basically drawing. You're much less concerned about color harmony, basically about the very technical side of painting. That takes a good deal of focus and discipline and mastery to be able to really engage in effectively. What I'm doing here though, you know, the, the palette is dark and moody and the subject matter is creepy swamp guy. It's actually a very playful process because I'm really looking at shapes and values and marks. I've got him sort of justified to the right side of my canvas here. I'm not sure if I like it. In my little sketch up here, he is somewhat justified right. He's not perfectly centered. And I think I like that, but I'm not sure. So this is what I mean is one of the potential downsides to just going in directly on your surface is that, you know, if you change your mind by your layout, you know, I'm not projecting this onto the surface where I can like really tweak where it's going to go. That would in some ways be the smarter or more efficient process to use, but that's not the point in this case. It's like a simulated battle, simulated struggle that I don't always want to engage in. I don't always want to do it because um, it's, it can be really challenging and you know, you can spend hours uh, working on an image and then find that you have to wipe something out completely that it's just not working. So now you can see I'm taking some of this pigment and my sock and it's going to look like I'm wiping everything out, but I'm actually just getting rid of this pure white, moving pigment around and creating that mid-tone. Like already, I can tell I'm probably going to have to shift, I can have to shift him over this way. That's what I'm talking about. But what happens is when I wipe this out, by default, there are some marks that are going to occur. And some of those will persist into the later stages of the image. And if they do make it to the end, they're a kind of record of the struggle. And uh, I think that's kind of fun. This is not a way to consistently deliver to a client. It's a very methodical approach to creating it, generating a picture that is uh, much more dependable. That's not what this is. I'm not trying to create the illusion of depth or reality. It's really just not my primary concern. Some amount of, you know, representation is necessary because, you know, I'm making a character, but the aim is not to create like an illusion to bring people into a picture. It's to observe, to see a physical thing, a painting, marks, a human was here. At this point, some of my marks in the background are becoming like too uh, structural to me. And the, the lines, like that's too, uh, almost like distracting. So I'm gonna like blur some of it. Yeah, that was too straight on the earlier one. I want some of that feeling of like, like a vintage Bigfoot photo, like where you catch him moving through the forest and he catches you watching him. There's something kind of cool about that that seems fitting for Swamp Thing. Now, if you look at my mix, this is going to get really juicy over here. This is going to become a mess. Basically, you, you don't want to be like worried about wasting paint with something like this. You're, you're inherently going to quote unquote waste paint. You're going to wipe stuff out, try passages, fail, try again. And again, I mean, I maintain that that's the point. You know, you can't be too careful with your pigments. Like you can't be too cautious or conservative with them. You need to allow yourself to use the stuff. That's what it's for. To me, some of the signature parts of the character are, uh, which I didn't get to on the sculpture, are the like root mustache. That part is pretty key. And in some, there's this almost like a steeple face or like a hood kind of face, like that cast shadow. A lot of deep, you know, cast shadows. Again, I'm not doing like a structural drawing here, so I have to kind of go slow, find it. 
It's dangerous. A little bit. <laughs> it's risky. It's a risky way of painting. Sometimes you fail. It's actually quite common. It's like um, simulated struggle, where the record of that struggle becomes a part of what is meaningful or interesting about the image. These passages may not stay, but I guess it's useful to show you guys how I'm using the sock right now. It's how I'm going to get back to lighter values and highlights. So I can I want to rub this out. The strokes are too meddlesome. I want to be able to see what I'm doing a little better. It's like clearing back. But I keep some of it because, again, some of those little marks in the background may grow into something else. Something is always depicted with these. They can look actually kind of ridiculous. These big, big mega pecs. I want to kind of get some of that. So now I've got enough pigment down. I'm actually going to lay my brush down for a minute. I've got enough pigment down that I can kind of start to paint with the white of the, just with the sock. Swamp Thing's headshot. Look how much I work out. I'm perfect for your part. Look at my pecs. I do find it pretty ridiculous, like when I'm painting stuff like this. You sort of see your, like when you're painting from imagination and it's sort of funny to see your values on display. It's kind of comical. It's just funny to see yourself drawing muscly swamp people by choice. <laughs> For now, I'm, I'm almost, I'm darkening this almost to make it easier to see. Like turning this into a two-tone, you know, getting that one-two read, lights and darks. But I will probably go back in here and knock in some other values. For now, this is really useful just for finding my shapes. That's not bad. Okay, a little bit, this shoulder is a little bit low. I'm not going to smudge it all out, but I'm just not really feeling that arm yet. It feels like it's crammed into frame, and I want it to feel like it naturally just extends beyond frame. In some cases, I kind of like the little smears that are taking place. Because Swamp Thing is covered in a lot of moss and stuff. So I'm not going to exactly smear this out, but I want to distribute some of that really concentrated pigment. I want to move it around and use it to tone this area a little more. This mode of painting really started to be explored in the late 1800s by a French artist named Eugene Carrier. He's like a contemporary of Rodin, like, like a friend of Rodin's and Monet, those guys. But lesser known, I think due to the nature of his work. It was, for the most part, monochrome, so less flashy. I mean, sometimes I refer to it as a glorified underpainting. The themes were quaint at times. Some of the images that he was most well known for were depictions of family life, uh, mothers and their children. And they are so sensitive and capture this like lightness, like a sense of love that was beyond narrative depiction. Like it was more than just the picture of a mother and her kid. It went to something about the feeling of love you have for your children. It was so sweet. <laughs> they are also somewhat melancholic. There's a kind of like, I think that's part of it, why they work. There's like, a, I don't know, an awareness of the fleeting nature of the thing. Those beautiful moments. For those of you who are parents, there are times when you're with your children that are just so filled with love and meaning. Part of what you could feel is that kind of tenderness, that kind of like sentiment. And it just so happens that that same mode of execution also really lends itself well to haunting imagery. There's an artist I saw, but I was in second grade and our class went to a book fair. And there was a book on the shelf. It was the creepiest thing I'd ever seen in my life, the picture on the cover. And it was scary stories. But the cover I saw, it was one of the most striking things I'd ever seen. I was a little boy. So I don't know why I knew to do this. Maybe, I guess, intuition that my parents would not want me to own that book. But I saved my lunch money for like a couple weeks. And I went and bought the book with my lunch money. I didn't eat. <laughs> I didn't eat. Brought it home. And I don't know how long I had it, but I didn't have it long. My mom found it and um, she confiscated it. And I didn't ask her about it, actually. The book just disappeared. And I found it, I think I went snooping and I found it in like a drawer. That was like her secret mom drawer that we all knew about. So it wasn't that much of a secret. That's where she put her romance novels. <laughs> and yeah, so I found it, but I don't think I took it back. I think I was like ashamed. And I think the intent was to shelter me and, you know, protect me from this spooky crap. And that did not have the desired effect because now I design creatures and I'm doing a Halloween demo series. And I think actually the fact that she took it from me only cemented my fascination with the thing. It really made me more intrigued. It kind of looks like Swamp Thing's wearing a little hat.
those images uh, by Stephen Gamel, as I looked through it as an adult, it struck me how similar the image making, the aesthetic was to what I had started to screw around with in oil paint. Then in college, when I was taking a painting class, you know, as all this kind of like classical painting techniques that honestly didn't resonate with me that much. And, you know, when I saw Carrier's work, it was really distinct compared to other things I'd been seeing. And honestly, the sort of expressive modern art kind of stuff, I, I totally understand the criticisms of those movements and their shortcomings. But I also think there was a lot of genuine innovation occurring. There were people that were really doing interesting things. Artists like Franz Klein, Egon Schiele. There's some genuine experimentation and I guess what you'd call like risk taking occurring. Personally, I just kind of in, in general, I value you know, when artists are trying to do their own thing, or trying to just be themselves, really. I just respect that, it's, it's hard to do. It's something I try to do and it's something that's a long process. You don't come out the gates like a fully developed, mature, artist with a mature voice takes time and perseverance and self-belief should get Stan anatomy to come in and always be open to feedback. Now I have a tendency to get pretty obsessive with this stuff so I need to kind of like take a step back for a minute and get my head straight so to speak and make sure I'm not beating the thing to death. The head is too far back on the body but I like the body more than the head so I'm going to move the head. It just looked like it was set too far back on his shoulders and spine and it was making that his, his left shoulder um, look like it was projecting forward in space more. Because there's big traps that go back. I wonder if I can do a twist. I like the foliage I've gotten. I don't really want to disrupt it if possible. Need to come up a little more. The Swamp Thing mustache is so crazy. What a weird little design hook. Round one, fight! You'll notice a kind of a trend here. This is also why, you know, you typically, it's why there's a comprehensive process for creating illustrations, is so you, you don't have to bang your head against the wall battling a painting. For me, this is part of the fun. The battle, quote unquote, is part of what makes it interesting. It's almost like a test or something for myself, like can I pull through? Sometimes I don't, but it's always valuable. I'd say it's not sustainable painting in this way. It's almost like I could do a couple tries a year like this. Because it actually takes quite a lot of energy. It's kind of like draining, you know, doing it, persevering through the battle. So I'm bringing back in some, like a middle tone. If I wiped out a little bit too much, it's getting a bit noisy, just too high contrast everywhere. So just kind of going back in and tinting everything. My sock, I just put a little bit here on my glove. My sock glove. That's where I have to, I have to be careful now. Sometimes late in a painting, it's almost like I'll self-destruct and just like screw the whole thing up. A lot of times I'll do is I'll just like work until I give up. And wherever the image was determines whether or not it gets wiped and recycled or if it gets another pass later on. One thing I'm happy with right now is this kind of like the way the background is is sort of like conveniently framing him. It's kind of a classic error of composition is just like to conveniently framing your subject matter. What I want to do is remove these small lines, the fibers uh, from the brush strokes in here, from the rag. Some of it gets a bit too noisy. So I'm like going back and softening. Okay, it's about to get real. I got to get on my knees. Get in here on these lower parts. Evening out my middle tones. I'm gonna lay in some shadows underneath this beard so I can take another stab at the ferns. Make some softening passes here. Because basically I want this to kind of fall away. And I actually think it kind of looks cool, a little more mysterious and helps with a little bit of depth. Basically throwing a lot of stuff into shadow here near the end, make my job easier. Could go through and hit everything in this way, but it's a little risky. Oil painting is so unforgiving in that way. I uh, just compared to Photoshop. Like part of me wants to go in and, you know, attempt to blur the foliage. It's it's cool to be able to create a beautiful image. It's even cooler to do it the old-fashioned way. It's a kind of personal goal for myself to slowly chip away at this, um, you know, these traditional media until I figure them out. No matter what part of the industry you're in, you know, if you're, if you're creating art, I highly, highly recommend you 
attempt to pursue and understand some traditional media. It's very discouraging at first. You know, you're not gonna get the same sort of like immediate feedback or gratification that you can with digital tools. But the way I look at it, it's like a long-term investment in your career. Like, yeah, you have your, have your digital skill set that you can use in your day-to-day -day life, pay your bills, and on the side, pursue mastery in uh, something really challenging. This basically looks like Thanos, Swamp Thing. <laughs> Green Thanos, Granos. I'm really having trouble with this shoulder. What a noob. When in doubt, smear it out. Armless Swamp Thing. I think I have to try to bring back the arms just somehow, just becoming a little too like sculptural or something. Like, if you ever use Smudge Tool in Photoshop, like what I'm doing with my thumb right now is what Smudge Tool is simulating. It's a very light touch. Let's see if I can pull off some kind of beard. Using the rough side of my sock. It's got a lot of uh, tooth. It's got a lot of uh, little fibers. I've sort of just been waiting for the right spot to maybe to use it and this might be it. Here in the, something like a beard, like a mossy beard. I love this idea of a fern beard. Um, we did it in the print earlier. I've tried it a couple times today on this guy, and uh, so far I have not nailed it. But I'm feeling it right now. Like I just have to be selective. It doesn't have to be all over. One more right in that little hole, and that might be enough to just communicate this idea. That's really all. It's like a a fern beard. Just a little fern beard. Is that too much to ask for? All right, guys, I think we're going to call it. Whenever I do one of these paintings, like I mentioned, it's a kind of a battle. But I'd say today we won, or at least we didn't give up. And that's what matters. I hope you've enjoyed um, observing this process, and I encourage you all to try painting with a sock. Oh, and if you guys enjoyed this, and you liked hearing me rant, check me out. Shape Carver on Instagram. <laughs> 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 that smoked me out. <laughs>